Okay, well, thanks for joining us, everyone. Uh, it's 12.30 Eastern, uh, 9.30 Pacific, and I can see that we even have someone joining us um, from uh, across the, the world as well. So, so thank you for, uh, for attending. I'm just gonna ask everyone when you come in just to uh, put your videos off if possible and uh, mute yourself so that we can uh, ensure to uh, give Jason our full and complete attention. So thank you so much for joining. Um, I'd like to introduce our speaker today. Our speaker is Jason Yee. Um, Jason is an advice-only financial planner, um, but has a prolific history, which I know that uh, he's really excited to share with you. Um, Jason runs Fine Point Solutions, uh, his own company that uh, he started, and um, I'm really excited for him to delve into the CPP webinar today. Um, Jason is a bit of a subject matter expert on CPP. He's done a ton of research and he's really dedicated uh, a lot of his planning career to uh, deep diving and understanding of the Canada Pension Plan and the various um, changes that are occurring within it. So uh, thank you, Jason, for joining. And I'd love to uh, have you introduce yourself and hear a little bit about uh, your company as well. Sure, thank you. Um, yeah, and thanks everyone for attending. Uh, my name is Jason Yi. I believe the Canada Pension Plan is underutilized and I want to change that. Uh, my background is mechanical engineering. I had a, my early career was as an engineer, mostly in uh, the oil sand and uh, did a little bit of finance and economics work while, um, you know, in my role as an engineer and ultimately uh, went through the CFA program and earned that designation. And when my time in the oil sands came to an end, I wanted to put sort of some of that finance uh, knowledge to work. So that's when I, you know, decided to uh, go into switch into financial planning. Uh, as an engineer and a financial analyst, the things about CPP that really appeal to me are um, going in you, the contribution side. You don't have a choice, but coming out, you know, when you when you get your benefit, when you get your retirement benefit, um, there's actually a lot of choices that individuals can make. There's a lot of options. There's a lot of um, opportunities for optimization, tax savings, uh, risk management, that type of thing. So that really appeals to me that 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 optimization process, integrating CPP with you know traditional financial planning or more conventional planning, um, seeing how things work together with a portfolio and how it can improve retirement income. I really like those kinds of things. And the other thing about CPP that um, appeals to me is I really like trying to simplify complex topics, and CPP is kind of a complex topic, so. Um, that's what I like to do. Fantastic. In my practice, I do, as Andrea said, I do the only financial planning, and I also do standalone CPP analysis. And so I guess what I'll mention about that is that's basically CPP number crunching, figuring out, um, you know, estimating benefits, things like that does not require, that standalone analysis does not require, you know, it's it's simply CPP stuff. You take people's contribution history, do all the CPP math, and that's really the inputs for financial planning. Um, it's, you know, in my opinion, you wouldn't make financial planning decisions with just CPP information alone because that doesn't necessarily include goals and, you know, the whole holistic thing. Um, so those are sort of the two main service offerings that Fine Point Solutions has. Fantastic. And and I would love to address with the room why you look like a chef, because <laughs> I think it's important <laughs> that everyone might be wondering why you're wearing an apron. So um, sure, perhaps yeah. you can share with everyone your, your fantastic attire choice today. Yeah. <laughs> So I'm going to be doing three live demonstrations using um, an ice cube tray analogy that I have for CPP. And so um, I've got liquid $20 bills. So this is going to represent uh, an individual's earnings. And this ice cube tray is going to represent an individual's CPP um, history. So um, with a lot of green liquid all over the office, um, you know, I've got the apron and a whole bunch of rags all over the place. <laughs> That's great. I love that we're using, um, you know, a real life demonstration to illustrate something that could be, you know, pretty heavy in terms of, um, you know, technical, uh, technical subject matter. So I really appreciate, you know, you putting your effort into um, designing this live demonstration for everybody today. Um, just to sort of be, uh, before we get started, everyone, um, there is a chat function uh, in the webinar today. You're welcome to address uh, Jason with your questions throughout the webinar. Um, he will be answering the questions that are specific around his demonstrations um, as we're going through the demos. 
If there's anything else CPP specific, we will be addressing the rest of the questions at the end of the webinar in the Q&A session. So really, really appreciate um, your attendance today. And um, with that, Jason, I would love to just get into an intro on the Canada Pension Plan. I think Jason's got some, uh, some visuals for us to uh, digest as we go through this today. Uh, yep, certainly. So I'm gonna just do the old share screen thing here. Okay, is that working? It is. Perfect, all right. So I like to start all CPP, CPP discussions reminding people of these valuable features because money from CPP is more than just a dollar amount. CPP is a dollar amount plus CPP is the peace of mind that those dollars will be there next month. CPP is a dollar amount plus CPP is the peace of mind that those dollars will be there till you die. And CPP is a dollar amount that keeps its purchasing power because CPP grows with inflation. Now, this is very different than money from an investment portfolio, which is subject to market risks, such as changes in portfolio value, and therefore is less certain about how much money will be available each month or how long uh, the money will last. Now, even if there's lots of money in an investment portfolio and there's a good chance that it will last, the fact that there still is some uncertainty or seeing the impact of those values change you know, may contribute to some anxiety for people. And so I really believe that balance is important among your sources of retirement income and you do have some control over how much uh, CPP you will receive. The purpose of the CPP. So to understand the purpose of the CPP, we're gonna literally go right to the source. The white paper on the Canada Pension Plan is credited as being the earliest explicit statement of the purpose of the CPP in an official document. And the white paper reads, the purpose of the Canada Pension Plan is to make reasonable, minimum levels of income available at normal retirement ages. And so throughout the webinar and the demonstrations, I'm going to be keep coming back to these points. What is reasonable? What is minimum? Because for the enhanced CPP, um, these things change a little bit. Uh, that's what's being modified through the enhancement. Uh, the purpose of the CPP also includes providing income to people who become disabled and the survivors of people who die. But today we're going to focus uh, specifically on the CPP retirement pension. and um going to just assume that everyone for the demonstration is going to assume that someone who retires is going to do so at age 65. So we're not going to do any age adjustments or any of those details. The enhancement of the CPP is what's considered, um, impacts what's considered minimum and reasonable. And so that's, that's going to be the focus. And we will be delving into the enhancements later on in the webinar today. So Jason does have, um, you know, a lot more information on what is changing, what has already changed, and what's changing specifically in 2024 that we ought to be aware of, both as either a business owner or as an employee. Um, so important to understand the changes and the potential uh, ramifications thereof that we'll begin into later. So uh, sorry about that, Jason, just wanted to add in there. No, that's perfect. Um, okay, so what do each of these three concepts mean? Reasonable can mean, you know, basically, the more you put in, the more you'll get out. And that can also be said, the more you make through employment earnings, the more you'll get out. Now, lifetime average earnings is the single number that represents what you put in. Now, in saying that, I kind of want to point out there's a difference between the CPP world and the real world. In CPP world, there's a maximum amount of earnings. I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about that and demonstrate, show that through the demonstrations. So there's a maximum amount of earnings that you make contributions on. So any earnings or income that you make above those maximums is not considered at all for CPP purposes. So you might have a, a, a real life lifetime average, and then there's your CPP lifetime average. And when I refer to lifetime average today, it's going to be your CPP lifetime average. Whatever your CPP lifetime average earnings happens to be, you're going to get a part of that number back as a retirement pension. And that's what minimum means. It's that minimum amount that CPP is intended to provide to you. So for the basic CPP or the part before the enhancements came into effect, you're going to get 25% of your lifetime average earnings back as a retirement pension. So for example, if your lifetime average earnings was $50,000 per year, you're going to get $12,500 per year back as a retirement pension from CPP. Normal retirement ages, this is the part where you have a very important choice, your start date. Uh, for the webinar, I'm mostly going to just point things out about this. I'm not going to go into a lot of this discussion about um, the start date decision. Really quickly, parts of the CPP. 
Uh, since the enhancements come in, retirees are going to, when they receive their CPP, they get one number, they get the total, but there's really three, now there's really three parts to that total. And they're referred to as the basic CPP, the first additional CPP and the second additional CPP. And so the enhancement, which is what we're talking about today, uh, encompasses both the first and second additional CPP. So with that, I'm gonna jump right into the first demonstration. So fantastic. And as you set that up, maybe I'll just clarify um, the maximum that the CPP is based on is also uh, what is changing with the enhancements as well. So to date, uh, I believe the basic CPP um, plus the first enhancement was based around income of about 67,000, Jason, is that about right? And then the enhancement will increase that uh, maximum income level to about 75,000 or so. So I just so wanted to... Yeah, so for 2024, uh, the first maximum threshold is 68,500, and the new threshold is 73,200. Thank you. Appreciate that. Okay, so let's just do this. I think I'm set up for this demo. Okay, so this demonstration, we're going to start with the basics, um, the basic CPP, so the part before the enhancement. I'm going to show what is meant by your CPP lifetime average earnings. That I'm going to show uh, has some special rules called dropouts work. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the dropouts, just do a quick demo about how the dropouts can raise your lifetime average. And then later, I'm going to build off this demonstration to show um, how the enhancement works. And also, um, for these demos, as I mentioned before, we're going to assume uh, a person retires at age 65. So, whether you're working or not, or even whether you care at the time or not, every Canadian has their own personal CPP clock. And that clock starts ticking when you turn age 18. The clock ends when you start your CPP benefit, start any CPP benefit, such as when you start receiving your retirement pension, or the clock ends when you turn age 70 if you do nothing. Now, I refer to the time between age 18 and when the clock ends as your CPP working life. In CPP language, this period of time is formally called your contributory period, your CPP working life is the period of time where a Canadian is required to participate and contribute a portion of their earnings into the CPP program. Everyone has their own personal CPP record, and that record tracks the numbers about how much you contribute into CPP and how much you earned up to a maximum threshold and that uh, each year in your CPP working life. So let's start with um, a single year. So this prop represents just one year. So you'll notice I've got this lower threshold here. This lower threshold is called YBE, or the year's basic exemption. This threshold uh, is used to tell if certain CVP rules uh, can be applied. And so I'm gonna come back to that specifically today when we're talking about contributions and how that works there. The second higher threshold is called the year's maximum pensionable earnings. And so this is what Andrea was just mentioning. So once you earn more than the max, once you earn YMPE, you've made contribute contributions on the maximum for that particular year. Any income that you make above YMPE for the basic CPP is irrelevant to CPP and is not considered. You don't make contributions on it and it doesn't go into the calculation for your lifetime average. Now, the top of the ice cube tray compartments represents YMPE. And so I'll know this, although this isn't a perfect representation, an ice cube tray does a great job for simulating your personal CPP record. Uh, the scale works, works pretty well. As you can see, we've got starting at age 18 all the way to 65. And so the more you put in, the more you'll get out. So someone who only makes a small amount of earnings throughout their working life, their average is going to be, their lifetime average is going to be a lot smaller than someone who makes a lot. And so typically what you'll see, you know, age 18, people might be going to school, not working as much, they'll have lower earnings as they're 
careers advance, progressively make more and more. And to get the maximum pension from CPP, it's really simple. All the compartments in your ice cube tray need to be full. If they're not full, if you haven't contributed uh, you know, the maximum amount throughout your working life, then you're not going to get the maximum back out. But there's a rule called dropouts that help raise your lifetime average. And so that's what I'm going to demonstrate right now. And to do that demonstration, we're going to assume that this person received the maximum all the way up to age 50. This could be for um, for a client who perhaps is looking to um, retire early or financial independence, as they call it, fire or um, potentially even a coast fire type of scenario. Correct? Exactly. OK, so. When you add up and take the total of all your lifetime earnings and then spread those earnings evenly out evenly so that there's the same amount in each year, that's your CPP lifetime average. And so we can simulate that with the ice cube tray by just tilting it back and forth. I promise this worked much better in my trial runs. Whoa. That's okay. No one's measuring you. It's all good. <laughs> and you know, this needs, doesn't need to be perfect. So, you know, we're not putting satellites in orbit here. So this new level, once we've added up, taken the total of all your earnings and then spread them out over all available years in your CPP working life, this new level represents your CPP average earnings. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to mark that level. To show the impact of something called dropouts. And what dropouts are is they're basically forgiveness. CPP recognizes that people might have years with low or even no earnings at all. And so it doesn't necessarily want to penalize you because it realizes that people might have, uh, you know, good reasons for that. So one, one reason is child rearing, um, raising children. So when you, uh, the primary caregiver of children between up to age seven might be able to drop out some of their low or no earning years. Uh, CPP also gives everybody uh, what's called the general dropout. So everyone is allowed to remove 17% of their lowest years. And so I'm going to just reset this right quick for the second part of the demonstration. And so for someone who's retiring at age 65, 17% works out to be eight years. And so for this tray, we're gonna just assume we're just gonna give that person nine years. We're gonna we're gonna drop out, we're gonna drop out three compartments in their tray. And I'm gonna simulate that by removing using Play-Doh to remove the ability. of the earnings to be redistributed into these years. So kids, Play-Doh is good for something beyond Play-Doh is what you're telling Absolutely. me. Absolutely. It's great for Fantastic. science projects. Let's see, this is why I have the, <laughs> the apron. And so now when I total up this person's earnings and then spread them out evenly among all available years, because there's less free space or less years, less room in this tray, overall tray, the overall average is going to be higher. And so I'll just quickly show that. And so what you'll notice now, or what you should notice, or what I see is that level has come up higher than where we marked it. And so that's very quickly how the dropouts work.
And Jason, when someone has their CPP, let's say, um, you know, clients will give us their, you know, CPP statements, are the dropouts already factored into that? Or is that something that's calculated at retirement time? That's a really good question. Uh, you brought up a really good point about the estimates because um, the general dropout is considered as part of the the statements and and the estimates because everybody gets them. But Service Canada doesn't necessarily know that you've had children or you're the primary caregiver of children. And so the child raising dropout does not um, is not part of those those estimates. And so that's one of the that's one of the two main reasons why those estimates can be uh, vastly inaccurate compared to what someone uh, occasionally would get. And so um, those estimates, the time you receive that estimate, whatever your lifetime average earnings happens to be on that date, that estimate is going to assume that you continue to earn that amount until you're until you turn age 65, actually. And so that, uh, that those estimates are going to be inaccurate if for any reason, you know, your, your lifetime average happens to be different from that assumption. And then anyone who's a primary caregiver um, who is entitled to those dropouts, that's when you see a lot of inaccuracies with, with those uh, service count estimates. So then likely the assumption is that someone won't really know what their entitlement actually is until they go to apply for Canada Pension. Would that be more in the range of, of accurate? Uh, or they could be a call and I can give them an estimate. <laughs> <laughs> or call Jason and he'll be able to do the dropout provisions for you. And yeah, there are, there are, you know, there are, um, there are software, like there is websites, online calculators. There are some that are pretty good. Uh, there's not a lot that, that, you know, really dive into the details and do everything, you know, exactly, uh, you know, as you'd find it in the CPP Act. But there are some pretty good ones out there. So you need to, you know, every professional out there needs to sort of make a decision, you know, how accurate they want to be. There are some good ones out there. There are other um, professionals out there like myself that do, that do provide estimates and some of them, you know, do provide really good uh, estimates as well. Yeah, fantastic. So I think we're, we're going to talk now about the pillars of the Canadian retirement income system. Is that correct? Yes, and I lost my mouse for some reason. Huh. Apologize for that. Okay, perfect. Um, are there any questions just on that first demo before we move on? I don't see anything in the chat right now, Jason. So why don't we just keep going and then if anything comes up, I'll let you know. Perfect. Okay. Uh, so in Canada and in many countries around the world, a three pillar system is used as a framework to describe and establish policy for retirement income and how people get their retirement income. So prior to the enhancement to the CPP, minimum from the purpose of the CPP that we started with at the, at the beginning is meant to replace 25% of your lifetime uh, average. And so the original design of the system, CPP plus OAS was meant to provide about 40% earnings replacement. And so CPP provided 25%, OAS provide 15. And so that goes back to the original design of those programs. Now the expectation is for an individual to maintain their standard of living in retirement, government programs establish a minimum level of, of, of support. And so that's what pillar one is supposed to provide, just a minimum basic level of support. The rest of what an individual is needed, uh, sorry, the rest of what an individual will need is expected to come from employer-sponsored plans and an individual's own personal retirement savings. The three pillars estimate. are supporting your, sorry, sorry go ahead. That, Jason. I was just going to say an estimate from, uh, I believe, uh, is that only about 30 to 35% of individuals now have employer-sponsored plans. So the onus is really upon uh, everyday Canadians to take more of their own retirement income support into their own uh, into their own hands and really make that um, a priority for themselves. You're right. There has so there's been two effects going on. There's been a a, a decline, a sort of a decline or conversion from defined benefit pensions to more uh, so total value, I guess of. DB pensions is declining. Uh, the total value and the uh, you know uh, access to defined contribution 
pensions is increasing, but overall, when you add those two up, the num the amount offered by employers through through pension programs overall is has been declining. Jason, we have a few questions. I'm not sure if you want me to uh, address them now. Sure. Sure. Um, did the pensions branch ask you about how many dropout years you have when you get to retirement age, or how did they determine um, that provision? How do they determine that provision? So when you go to apply, let's say, yeah. uh, how do they know? Or do they, I, I think the question is really, how do they determine um, those dropout years? And I'll let you sort of clarify on that one. So the amount that you're entitled to, so that's that's at 17%. Um, so everybody gets that, how they determine the actual time is, so they'll look at your CPP record. Okay. And so I've been referring to everything in terms of years. Uh, that's a simplification in C for the CPP calculations. Everything's done in months. So the first thing they're going to do is convert everything to a monthly basis. And then they're going to look for your lowest months and drop out those months. For the child rearing, that gets a little bit more complicated. There's some sort of tests that they do to see if you qualify. There's actually um, two tests. There's two possible uh, child rearing dropouts that might apply. Um, why don't I come back to that at the end? Sure. If that's still the question, I just want to make sure that, that that's the question. Because um, yeah. that's a bit more of a technical answer and uh, might take yeah, a bit. Yeah, for sure. There's a few other questions. Why don't we save them until the end and, and then we can address them all. Sure. Perfect. Okay, so the three pillars are supporting your income needs until the end. So together, the three pillars are what is going to provide Canadians with the money they need until they die. And so by design, none of these pillars by themselves is intended to provide all the income that an individual might need. Retirement income from all three pillars needs to work together. And so therefore, uh, it needs to be done holistically. And that's this is where the financial planning that Andrea and myself, uh, you know, get to do is, you know, we that's what we do is we look at all your retirement income sources and figure out the best way to generate income for life. And Jason, there's just a question on that on that prior slide. If CPP provides 25% in the in the basic CPP model, how much does OAS provide? And then conversely, GIS. Um, GIS is an income tested benefit, so uh, we can we could go into that in, in other details. But how much is OAS uh, intended to um, support in that pillar? The original design of OAS was about 15% of earnings up to the same maximum as CPP, I believe. There has been, so along with the CPP enhancement, there at the same time, there were also some changes to OAS. I'm not sure actually what, what sort of, if there isn't a revised number, a revised target for of income replacement due to the OAS part. I know for CPP, um, it's increasing from 25% to 33%, but the OAS part, I'm not exactly sure. Yeah, and what I can comment on that is, you know, old age security is not an income tested benefit, it's a, it's a residency tested benefit, and it's really right. meant for lower income seniors, and that's why there's an OAS clawback provision. So I'm not sure if, uh, in terms of being able to count on old age security and then subsequently the guaranteed income supplement, if that's accessible for all Canadians who are part of um, the retirement income system, it's really there to help supplement the lower, mid to lower right. income um, Canadians. Uh, who do not maybe have access to the other two pillars. Exactly. So why enhance this, the CPP? Uh, you know, it's basically because there's been unfavorable trends with pillars number one and two. And this is sort of what we were, we were just talking about, you know, with the whole DB, DC, and the, 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 the gradual decline in coverage by employer-sponsored programs. So in particular, that coverage has been declining and a lot more of the money in pillars two and three is exposed to market risks. And so that's, an, that's you know, and less from guaranteed sources. And so that was another driving factor that the Department of Finance cited when, you know, when they proposed and implemented the enhanced CPP. And so therefore they, well, there's more pressure on individuals to get it right themselves, whether that's through do-it-yourself investing, planning, or through the, through the advisors they, they hire.
it was decided to address the weakening of pillars two and three by strengthening pillar one. And so that's what the enhancement to the CPP is. Jason, when was that decided upon and how did they make that, um, that, you know, that change over what period of time um, was that analysis done and, and what have they done to date? So they've, I'm not sure when that process started because there were other reforms. I'm not sure if it's, a, if it was, if this enhancement was a plan when they did an earlier set of reforms or not. Um, yeah, I really don't know the that historical answer, but and so what was the second part of your question? Uh, it was really to, you know, how did they assess going from 25 to 33 percent, for example? I'm assuming that was based on research that they had done and then uh, phasing that in over a period of time subsequently. I'm not sure exactly how they came up with that 33 percent number. I don't have an answer for that. So what okay. I'll do is no, if I can fair. if I can find that if I can find that out. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if there's going to be any follow on notes. If there's if there's questions that I can answer after after the webinar and, and have them sent out to uh, to the attendee yeah. list, I'll no do problem. So. Yep. Okay. So the enhanced CPP impacts both the reasonable part of the purpose of the CPP and the minimum part. Uh, sort of mentioned this a little bit before, the enhanced CPP has two parts. And one thing that I'm going to point out here is it's going to take 40 years to get the full effect of these changes. And so I'm going to demonstrate what's meant by that um, right away with demonstration number two. So let's set up for that. Fantastic. There are a couple more questions, which we'll we'll save to the end. And, and thank you. Um, to Laura for responding to one of the questions in the chat. Um, uh, one of the questions was, I've heard accountants advise to minimize a business owner's salary by taking a salary of 10% of the CPP max and the rest is a dividend. And what is the point? Um, we're gonna get into a bit of the, the business owner discussion towards the end. So we will we will address that, um, but I appreciate the question. Sorry, go ahead, Jason. I So do you have the answer for that? Cause I think I know the answer to that. Go for it. So, what comes to my mind is, so I had mentioned before that there's this minimum, this year's basic exemption. And so to qualify for things like the survivor benefit, the death benefit, um, you need to have a minimum, you actually need to have a minimum number of qualifying periods, this is what they call it, MQP, uh, and or minimum number of years that you contribute in. So you're earning, you need to contribute more than this minimum for a minimum number of years to qualify for those benefits. The CPP disability benefit also has a minimum qualifying period, but it's that minimum amount that you need to contribute on is not based on YBE. It's actually based on 10% of YMPE. So that might be why that advice uh, was made. It's so business owners can retain eligibility for the CPP disability benefit. That makes sense, thank you. Okay, so the enhanced CPP is going to increase the earnings replacement from 25% to 33%. The first additional CPP takes care of how that's done on your earnings up to YMPE. The second part of the enhanced CPP is going to increase that maximum amount. It's going to increase the maximum amount of earnings that are subject to participation in the plan. So in order to increase the amount of earnings, that are subject to participation in the plan, there's now a new upper earnings threshold. Called the YAMPE or year's additional maximum pensionable earnings. So eventually an individual's personal CPP record is gonna look something like this. It's gonna have this new uh, higher threshold. So a new higher level of earnings that they can receive or that they might earn and will contribute into CPP for. So the calculations for the additional CPP are a little bit different and this goes 
for both the first and second additional. And so this demonstration is going to show how this works with the second additional. And so the first additional sort of works in the same way. For the second additional CPP, the amount you get as a retirement pension takes your best 40 years starting in 2024, which is when the second additional CPP took effect. This means there's a 40 year transition period for the second additional CPP. Now, for example, someone who, contrib someone who contributed into the second additional CPP this year in 2024, and then retires right away in 2025, that individual only has one year contributing into the second additional CPP. So the rest of the years that are required for the best 40 part of the calculation are effectively zero. They don't exist because the second additional CPP hadn't existed that long yet. Most of this person's working, for most of this person's working life, there was no additional second additional CPP. So there's no second additional CPP retirement pension to earn for the time prior to 2024. And so this means for that person, their earnings replacement is actually going to remain closer to that original 25 rather than 33. The younger you are right now in 2024, when the second additional CPP takes effect, the more of your CPP working life will include second additional CPP contributions. And so the closer you'll get to earning the full 33% of earnings replacement. Now, someone like myself in mid-career will have contributions into the enhanced CPP for about half their working life. And so their earnings replacement is gonna be somewhere close, somewhere in between that 25 and 33%. Now, someone age 18 in 2024, or soon to be age 18, has the potential to contribute into the second additional CPP for the full time it takes to get the best 40 years. And so that's what it takes to get the full earnings replacement up to 33%. It takes 40 years of contributions into the additional CPP. And so the time from now until the first people with 40 full years, that's what's referred to as that transition period. The difference in calculation procedures between the basic CPP from demonstration number one and the enhanced CPP with the 40 year transition period provide some generational fairness. Uh, young, younger Canadians will contribute more into the enhanced CPP than older. And so they'll younger Canadians will get more benefit. They'll get more out. Fantastic. Thanks, Jason. So that makes sense why, you know, they're aligning that in a way with, you know, fewer workplace pension plans, fewer DB plans. And they're trying to support the, the up and coming generation with a higher baseline pillar one. Yes, exactly. So the core principle for what is reasonable has remained unchanged with the additional, with the enhanced CBP. The more you make, the more you'll get out. What's changed is the level of earnings subject to participation in the CPP. And so that's that higher earnings threshold, the YAMPE. The amount of earnings replacement considered to be the necessary minimum has increased from 25% to 33%. Uh, this is just a graphical representation that shows those implementation steps. So step number one, starting from the basic CPP only, this shows that earnings replacement rate, and that applies on your earnings up to the first threshold, y, y MPE. Then in step number two, adding the first additional CPP in 2029, that's when uh, first additional took effect. And so raising the earnings replacement from 25 to 35, and step two just shows um, you know, the additional amount of earnings subject to participation in the CPP. Yeah, Jason, I think you said 2029 there, but I think you meant 2019, just to clarify. I meant 2019. Thank you very much. <laughs> no problem. And so this is sort of the same graphical representation for contributions. I'm going to um, skip this, actually, and just kind of go straight into... Uh, demonstration number three. 
Perfect. And, and there's another question, Jason, I don't know if uh, you can address this. Um, what are your preferred online calculators for all of this? I don't use them. I have my own calculation spreadsheets that I built by kind of going through the CPP Act and figuring it all out. Okay. Okay, so as a reminder, You don't have to contribute into the CPP on your first $3,500 of earnings. That YBE has a fixed dollar amount of $3,500. So on any money you make up to that first threshold, you don't have to pay into CPP for. Now, for every dollar you make between the YBE and YMPE for the basic CPP, you pay 4.95% as a contribution into the plan and your employer also contributes a fully matched 4.95%. For the first additional CPP, again, on the money you earn between the YBE and YMPE, you pay 1% on each dollar, and your employer also contributes a fully matched 1%. All the way up to YMPE. Now, for the second additional CPP, there's a new higher earnings threshold called YAMPE. For every dollar you make, above YMPE up to that new threshold, you contribute 4%. And your employer also contributes a matching 4%. So what does all this get you? This 9.9% .9 total between your basic portion and your employer's basic portion made on your behalf buys you the 25% of lifetime average earnings that you made between YBE and YMPE over your working life. This 2% total between your first additional portion and your employer's first additional portion buys you the increase from 25% from to 33% on the lifetime average of your earnings made between YBE and YMPE. The 8% from the second additional CPP buys you the 33% of earnings replacement on the money you make between YMPE and YAMPE. And so that's what all these contributions get you. So if your earnings are less than the YMPE, which in 2024 was that 68,500, and you're mostly going to be, you know, earn no more than about that amount, you probably won't ever have to pay for this increase. But whether your income is enough to be in that new higher band or not, new, con new contributions from earnings on both bands is going to ultimately increase the earnings replacement from 25% up to 33% over that 40 year transition period that we, that I described in demonstration number two. Great, thanks, Jason. So in essence, that extra 8% in total contributions um, represents that extra 8% in total pension um, that someone over a 40 year time frame could expect who earns up to the YAMPE. Right, yes. Okay. You know, and so this just graphically sort of summarizes that, that demo. So we'll just go on to that. And so this table summarizes the contribution rates. And this is a nice, simple way to look at CPP contributions based on the type of employment relationship you have. So the employee portion is straightforward. But for the employer's portion, uh, the employer may be you or your company. So that's important to remember. It's a nice way to think about it because it helps remember the tax treatment. Tax credits or deductions are available to the party or entity 
who pays the associated part uh, of the contribution. And this is just the same information in, in, in dollars. Now, I will point out that there is a choice available for incorporated self-employed business owners because incorporated business owners have the choice to compensate themselves with salary versus versus dividends. And so there is a bit of a cost benefit uh, analysis to do there based on your personal situation. Uh, I'm not gonna go into great detail about that. What I do wanna point out though is if you were to just simply add up these numbers and say, I pay this when I take salary and I don't have to pay that when I take dividends, that's too simple of an answer because there's other sort of subtle effects going on um, in that sort of cost benefit trade-off. You know, a, a colleague of ours, Arav, um, Aravind, Sam, Sam Pirelli, I probably Pirelli. butchered that, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> did a really nice uh, article series and webinar uh, last month that really highlighted these effects. I like what he did because he addressed all those little nuances uh, and those typically get overlooked at in that salary versus dividend consideration. And so that's more of, um, I would say that's more of a, of a business owner, you know, corporate uh, analysis than it is a CPP analysis. The CPP part is really just the inputs into that more complex analysis. Yeah, and what I will say in, in working with business owners is that is a very um, individual assessment. Um, there's no one size fits all solution because there's a lot of complexity involved there. There really is, and it and you know it really deserves you know that detailed uh, you know look at like like any like every business owner uh, you know. The salary versus dividends is complex enough before considering CPP, and so CPP just adds another another little touch onto it. Is that something that your company is able to provide to someone? Is an analysis that includes um, that lens? No, and the reason is is I don't work with a lot of business owners anymore. I typically work with individuals and families, and so at this point, and so because that's more of you know that that corporate planning, it's it's really more of a corporate planning analysis. And I just don't work with with business owners anymore. Um, like I can do I can do the CPP calculations part, but you know, you're really getting into tax integration and all those other things because that's that's how you need to do that analysis. Even though there's it's the CPP part, it sort of all needs to be done together because the CPP impacts um all those other things. So so to give you an example, um Oh, uh, maybe not. That's we're kind of running out of time, and that's going to get complicated. No, I appreciate that. Just a, a quick question uh, from the audience: Could you repeat what the one percent plus one percent of the first additional CPP buys again? Sure. That buys you. Let's go back. Okay. That buys you the increase in earnings replacement from 25% to 33% on your earnings up to YMPE. Does that make sense? So prior to the first additional, you'll get 25% earnings replacement on, your, on the earnings that you make up to the YMPE threshold. Yep, I think uh, I think that's clear. Thanks, Jason. Okay. Uh, another question is: Do you work with non-residents who are planning their retirement and would like to calculate their entitlement? Yes. Okay. Great. Okay. So when planning, uh, you know, for the income you'll need until the end, it's important to consider the characteristics of each of your sources of retirement income. Each source has its own advantages and disadvantages, and each source of retirement income either has its own risks or it deals with a particular life risk in a favorable way. And so that's why 
I like to start any CPP discussion with reminding people of these valuable features. Your money from CPP is guaranteed. It lasts until you die and CPP provides inflation protection. Now, in my opinion, when doing retirement income planning, you should think about these four questions. What do you know? What's unknown? What can you control? And how safe do you want to feel? And so I believe when you consider these four questions, you're more equipped to find the balance that you need to be happy all the way to the end. It's especially important to think about those four questions when making your CPP start date decision, because this is where you have control to really move the needle about how much you'll receive from CPP on your own. The age you start, you start CPP moves the needle because there are adjustments that will either shrink or grow your pension amount, depending on whether you start earlier than age 65 or later than age 65. You can start as early as age 60 or as late as age 70. Your CPP amount will shrink more the earlier you start compared to age 65, or your CPP amount will grow more the later you start your CPP compared to age 65. And Jason, just, just oh. to clarify for the audience as well, um, would you mind commenting on the additional CPP contributions that you can make if you continue to work past age 65? So the way the additional works is it's not like, um, yeah, that's a good question. It's not like the basic CPP where there are those age adjustment factors per se. Uh, the age adjustment factors do um, apply to the amount, but what the additional CPP does is it takes your best 40 years. So if you work past age 65 up to age 70 and you make more than any previous amount in the additional parts, it's just going to take the best. And then whatever that retirement pension amount is, whatever that, whatever those best 40 amounts are, if you are starting after 85, it will apply the age adjustment to those amounts. So there's sort of two adjustments that go on in that case. Great. There's another question, Jason, as well. Um, Laura says, I have observed non-resident Canadians who seems who seem to collect old age security and earn well over the clawback. Uh, no one seems to know about the OAS annual return. And when we mention this to them, they do obviously not want to file. Have you heard or seen any enforcement in this area? This would be for non-residents specifically. Or are you are you familiar with that at all? Or is that sort of outside the scope? Not too familiar with that. And so simple answer is no, I, I haven't seen that and not not too familiar with it. Okay, thanks. And Laura, I haven't heard of that either, unfortunately. Sorry, can't comment. Okay. Uh, so yeah, just sort of kind of coming back to the overall impact of the enhanced CPP on the purpose. So again, the core principle of what is meant by reasonable remained unchanged unchanged. The more you make, the more you'll get out. What changed is the level of earnings subject to participation in the plan. And that that's that new earnings threshold called YAMPE. Uh, minimum, the amount of earnings replacement considered to be the necessary minimum. That has increased from 25% to 33%. Uh, and as that previous question just sort of pointed out, that's that's that was done in the two phases between the first additional and the second additional. And so the first additional worried about raising that minimum from 25 to 33 up to the original threshold of YMBE. And then the second additional raised, raises the earnings replacement from 25% to 33% on the new thresholds between the original threshold YMPE and then the new one, the new maximum YAMPE. Oh man, I love that. Well, they haven't that. made that at all challenging, have they? <laughs> no, they haven't. <laughs> you know, and that's why I love to sort of impose my own language, like CPP working life rather than contribute to a period and, and, and things like that. And, you know, summarizing stuff, you know, the more you get, the more you put in, the more you get out as there is a lot of items, there's a lot of complexity and they certainly don't make, uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of other ones that, uh, yeah, that's fun. And then, Jason, and then just to, sorry, go ahead. 
Oh, I was, and I'm just going to mention that the age adjustment factors uh, remained unchanged. So just wrapping that up. Perfect. Um, we've got about five minutes left. So I um, wanted to open the floor to, to questions. Uh, so there's a, a question here. If a person who's paid into CPP dies before 65, can the widow still receive benefit from their spouse's CPP? So we're really Say that talking, again? Yeah, so we're just talking about spousal CPP benefits that are available if the payor into CPP dies pre-age 65 and assuming that they haven't started taking their mm -hmm. pension yet. Yep. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So survivor pension. Um, yeah. The, the survivors of a contributor are entitled to the survivor pension. And so if, um, if you're married or in a common law relationship, your spouse passes and your spouse was a contributor, you're entitled to that survivor's pension. Uh, assuming that the contributor contributed for that minimum uh, qualifying period, that's important. Um, there's been recent changes, and so there there used to be almost like a clawback. The younger you were, these these recent enhancements actually change that, so that that no longer applies. And there is a certain maximum amount, though, that can be, um, let's say, joined with your own CPP benefit and uh, your deceased spouse's widow's pension. Can you talk that a little bit? Yeah, so that's that's what's referred to as the combined benefits. So there's two possible combined benefits: your own pension plus. Um, Sorry. Yeah. So your own retirement pension plus your deceased spouse is so the survivor pension from that or your disability. No, sorry. Um, it's it's a combination between a survivor disability uh, pension. So if your spouse died, leave you survivor pension and you happen to be on a disability pension, that 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 combination. And so there is a maximum. Um, that those calculations get really complex, actually, and so uh, so what was the question about, about sort of explaining how that works, or really just is there a benefit? Um, so it, I think it's yes, there's a benefit, but if let's say uh, someone is already receiving, you know, nearly the maximum of their potential lifetime average earning CPP benefit, how much can perhaps a spouse's uh, widow benefit enhance that? There is a certain limitation mm -hmm. to how much you can collect, even if your spouse also uh, contributed almost their maximum lifetime earnings. Maybe just talking to, you know, you can, but there is sort of a limit to that. Yeah, you can, you can think of it as a top up. There's the potential to top up to what, um, what any individual would receive as a maximum. That's sort of the upper, the upper limit. Uh, the calculations for that top up and how all that works, it gets a little, it gets a little complicated, but that's the best way to think about it. It's the simplest yeah. way to think about it. Yeah, the, the way that I, I will talk to a client about it in simplistic terms is really just to say, whatever the maximum pension is for one individual, that is the maximum that you could potentially top up to if you if you have a, a survivor situation, depending right. on you know all the contributing factors and whatnot. Yeah. Um, are there any other questions for Jason while we still have him? Uh, well, I have a question, and it's about sure. Alberta, <laughs> because I mean, <laughs> okay. it's, it's a hot topic, and um, I have a lot of clients in Alberta um, who are really interested in this information. So with the potential exit of Alberta from the Canada Pension Plan, um, what, first of all, will that do for Albertans and their potential for a new Alberta Pension Plan? And then secondarily, what may that do to the existing pool of funds that has been set aside for future pensioners? So no idea what that means for Albertans because it's going to sort of depend a little bit of, on on what they do as a replacement. Um, what the CPB Act requires, though, is any province that goes their own way and starts their own uh, pension, the benefits need to be comparable to CPP. So the calculations, the way things work, don't need to be exact. And so the Quebec pension plan, QPP, uh, is very, very similar to CPP, but there are a few subtle differences. But overall, the level of benefits received is very, very close, even though there's different mechanics on, on how you, they come to those results. Alberta's would have to provide that as well. Uh, would there be any change in terms of the, the pension fund that CPP runs? Would part of that be split off and essentially handed over to, to pre-fund the new Alberta pension plan? And that's that sort of what Alberta is looking for is they're looking for their share of that, that total pool right now. And so, yes. And so any province that leaves, 
the Canada Pension Plan um, would be able to take some level of assets out to run their own program. And so basically to cover the liabilities that, that exist, you know, for their, for their province's population at, at that particular time. Right. Um, and that seems to be the big debate uh, right now. Uh, uh, you know, what's that transfer amount going to be? Perfect. Uh, there's a request to see the charts one more time. Uh, someone's unclear on how much each additional CPP that they'll get based on the enhancement. So if you can just share that screen again, Jason, that would be great. Uh, and Russell, yes, the, the session is being recorded, so it will be available uh, on my website, I believe on Jason's website, as well as my uh, YouTube channel. So or is, Evan, is, is this uh, the chart? Sorry. Evan, is that the correct chart that you're looking for? Or do they want the tables with the dollar amounts and yeah that's the that's the correct one and, and evan i'm not sure if uh, jason's going to make this presentation available jason are you yep yeah i can do that the, for sure slides available yeah for sure absolutely um that that will be made available so just you can send me an email if, if anyone is interested in receiving the slide deck from this perfect uh, yeah, it is complicated, as we can see. There's a lot of factors that go into this, and it's definitely not for the everyday lay person um, to sit back and, and digest, which is why we have such amazing professionals like Jason, who take the time to really sit down and understand the legislation, um, what is uh, what has transpired and what is transpiring. Um, one more question. How often is CPP wrong? So I'm, I'm assuming what you mean by that, Laura, is are the estimates wrong? or if someone just applies by themselves, how often are they wrong? The estimates, it sort of depends on when you receive the estimate. If you are close to the age which and, and you're, with which you're gonna start, um, you know, so the time between when you get the estimate and when you start is really, really short. It's gonna be accurate unless you have been the primary caregiver of a child and you qualify for those dropouts because though those wouldn't be considered at all. Now, what you I would I believe you can do is you can call Service Canada, um, you know, by phone and ask them, you know, give them that information and ask them to do sort of I believe you can ask them sort of do you know an estimate with those dropouts. I've never actually tried that, but I've heard people mentioning that before. But mm -hmm. the the generic estimates that you get your from your statement of contributions when you log into your My Service Canada account, for example, or you phone them and have them send them to you. Um, like I said, those are based on an assumption that whatever your lifetime average earnings happen to be at that point in time, you're, those are going to continue. And so any employment or lack of employment that you do between the estimate date and when you ultimately retire, uh, any employment that you do or don't do that impacts your lifetime average, that's what's going to cause that estimate to be inaccurate. Uh, Laura is asking, so people must advocate for their dropout period. No, I don't believe that's the case, Laura. I think what Jason is saying is they'll automatically calculate um, the 17% dropout based on that monthly average, um, and they will do that proper calculation for you. Whether or not that's reflected, though, on your statements, I think is the question. Uh, I'm not I'm not sure that they've, I, I doubt that they've done the dropout provisions when you get your CPP statement, let's say in advance. But maybe that's a question that you can answer there, Jason. I guess. What do you mean by state, like the statement of contributions with with the estimate? Is that what? Well, the, yeah, the ones that will give you the estimate of your future pension. Yep. So that will consider the seventeen percent general dropout. It will. It will. Yes. And then, what about the additional dropouts? I, I think think the question is, do people have to advocate for that additional dropout on their own, or how does that get factored in, and when? the the child rearing and so so you so it's part of the application process for your CPP uh, retirement pension and so either okay. in there's there's two forms I guess you like when you there's a total package for your retirement pension and it has uh, a section and so you would need to provide the child's data you know a bunch of information like date of birth social insurance okay. number things like that um, and then if you applied but forgot to do that or or what have you there is a standalone form you know, again, for you to update things. And I believe you, you know, you would get retroactive payments, you know, if you were entitled to it and you know, applied after the fact. Okay. Uh, and I'm not sure for that one, if there's a time range for retro or not, but generally, you know, if you're entitled to it, you're supposed to, you're supposed to get it. And that's sort of the concept okay. built into the CPB Act. So 
So as long as you do it on your application, then it should be applied appropriately. Yeah. Other than child rearing, are there any additional types of dropout provisions that apply above the 17%? Yes, there is. Uh, so you can drop out any year you, or sorry, any month that you received a disability pension. Mm -hmm. so you're not penalized for that time. And then there is a rule if you, if you continue to work after age 65 and you earn more than one of your you know, one of the times pre age 65, there's sort of like a swap that you can do. Yeah. Uh, and so that sort of complicates that calculation a little bit. Okay. Uh, another question are, are times when you were disabled already accounted for on the My Service Canada website? So I, I suppose what, what we're referring to here is the, when you log into My Service Canada and let's say, you, like you mentioned, we have that dropout provision due to disability, would that already be factored in? In the estimate? Probably yeah. not. It's a good okay. question. That's a good question, actually. That one, I haven't dealt with that one before, but probably okay. not. Hmm. They would have that information that you're disabled, but um, hmm. I'm not sure. <laughs> okay, no, great question, though. Um, how does someone with contributions in another country, but there is a, a unilateral, let's say a CPP agreement with that country, obtain those credits? Is it done on the application or is it done in another facility? So if you're if you're having integration, let's say with with a foreign country, whether it's U.S. with Social Security or or another um, country in with there, which there's a uh, a treaty, how do you mm -hmm. go about? Um, I'm pretty sure that's a separate form because I'm just thinking about the standard uh, CPP retirement pension application, and I don't remember seeing those parts. So it's, I'm pretty sure it's a separate form, uh, and that what what that allows you is um, time where you if there's a treaty, time where you contribute into another country's uh, program will count towards that minimum qualifying period for things like the survivor, um, you know, the survivor benefit, death benefit, anything but the minimum qualifying period. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, these are really complex questions too. And, and I think, you know, even us who deal with CPP questions on a daily basis, this is, you know, it's not always uh, cut and dry in terms of um, the answers and, and also quite complex. So anyone trying to navigate this on their own, I, you know, I can understand how it must feel a bit overwhelming to really truly understand what you're entitled to at the end of the day. So um, Jason, thank you so much for, for helping to demystify this. Um, any last comments or words from, from yourself as a takeaway for our audience today? Uh, well, if you let me just throw a quick plug in, um, you know, I mentioned that I like to simplify complex things hang on sorry and so one of the things that i've done is sort of these animated videos are you able to see that yep yeah uh, so I've done some of these animated videos that sort of exp that sort of simplify some of the complexity. And so I've got two new videos that are being worked on right now. Um, the first one I'm hoping to release, you know, within the next month or so. And that one's going to be how to income split with Canada Pension Plan. So that one might be interesting to people. And video number three is going to look at how inflation works in the Canada Pension Plan. And where can people find your videos? On my YouTube channel, which I didn't put a link on, but that barcode... <laughs> <laughs> that I just showed. We'll get to the first one. And the YouTube channel is Fine Point Solutions. So if anyone wants to look yeah. that up, uh, that's what you can you can Google. Um, thank you so much again, Jason. Much appreciated. Anyone who's uh, looking to demystify their own CPP and really would love to get that fulsome analysis, whether you're a professional or whether you're an individual, please reach out to Jason directly. Um, you know, he's a wealth of resource and knowledge in this area. Um, which is really greatly required. And I'm getting lots of positive feedback in the chat, Jason, from uh, all the comments that I'm seeing. So I, I think everybody very much appreciates your perspective. And uh, thank you all for attending today. Enjoy the rest yeah. of your day. Today. I just want to thank all the attendees. I really like um, talking about CPP and answering questions when I can about Canada Pension Plan. So really appreciate your time today. Um, really happy to do this. My pleasure. Thank you.